Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Charmaine Lidlow, and on behalf of Dean Valdez and our entire Macaulay community, I would like to welcome you to our At Macaulay Faculty Scholar Series. Macaulay Honors College is celebrating its 20th anniversary, and we are happy that we can curate programming that features our students, our faculty, and alumni. We are also celebrating Black History Month, and tonight, our panel will explore the Harlem Renaissance and its global impact. Right now, I would like to introduce our guest, if our Dean Valdez and Zara Saeed and Dr. Brundage can join us online. And I'd like to pass it over to Dean Valdez. Thank you, Charmaine. For those of us who are really, really blessed to work with Charmaine, um, I just want to emphasize that she is works magic behind the scenes. She is our special events person and alumni relations manager. And we are so, so, so very just really honored and, and, and blessed to be able to work with her. I'm so excited for this event. Um, I do want to say that this for me is perhaps I today in particular, I've, I've, I've been speaking a, a good deal about the Harlem Renaissance. And uh, I was very much looking forward to tonight. And so I want to introduce my esteemed colleagues. Uh, Dr. Lisa Brundage is the Director of Academic Affairs here at Macaulay Honors College. In this role, she supports core functions of the department and oversees the Honors Seminars curriculum, as well as the Teaching and Learning Collaboratory. She is an alumna of the CUNY Graduate Center English Program, where her work focused on queer maternity in early 20th century literature. She has produced effective labor in all that work published, she's produced, she has published effective labor in alt at work, <laughs> produced videos for the Science Forward Open Educational Resource, which is available online, and we'll put that link up in a second, and has forthcoming work with Dr. Kelly O'Donnell, also at Macaulay Honors College, I know you have, <laughs> um, uh, on the Macaulay Honors College BioBlitz. She teaches Macaulay's Springboard course with Dr. Zora Saeed and is on the faculty of the Graduate Center's Interactive Technology and Pedagogy Certificate Program. Welcome, Lisa, this evening. Dr. Zora Saeed is one of our newest faculty members here at Macaulay Honors College. She is a co-editor of One Story, 30 Stories, an anthology of the contemporary Afghan-American literature published in 2010 by the University of Arkansas Press and editor of Langston Hughes, Poems, Photos, and Notebooks from Turkestan, Lost and Found, CUNY Poetic Documents Initiative out of the Graduate Center in 2015. She is a distinguished lecturer in the Macaulay Honors College here at the City University of New York, and she lives on Lenape lands. Welcome, Dr. Zora Saeed. Um, I also would like to say a couple of things. Um, Zora, both of these women are, as you have just noticed, incredibly multifaceted and brilliant and wonderful. Um, and so we are going to get into this conversation. I do also wanna say that due to unforeseen circumstances, Dr. Norrell Edwards is unable to join us tonight, um, but she did wanna be here. And so I, I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge that absence and don't want anyone in, outside to go, what, what? There was another fourth person on our posters. So did wanna say that. Lisa and Zora, Let's start with how did you both get to the Harlem Renaissance? Where did that, where, where did that interest um, stem from? Do, do, do. I'm not calling on you. Sure, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, for me, uh, I think that the, um, I'm not sure if, of course, I had classes in college about the Harlem Renaissance, and I was very interested in it. I didn't realize how international the reach of the Harlem Renaissance was. And once I started, um, you know, I went through the Central Asia route to find Hughes, and uh, that the emphasis that Harlem Renaissance, the art and work that was happening in Harlem is international and global and it had a large impact for me became very important when I saw how much of an impact and impression he made with uh, Uzbek Turkmen poets that he met along the way. So my work became uh, more focused on how do we take that um, energy and freshness that he brought and uh, um, that Langston Hughes brought to um, Uzbekistan 
and rural Turkmenistan because in all of his notes, he writes about how so-and-so could be, you know, sort of working at the newsstand in Harlem. And he sort of notes and he finds this way of the familiar and home in someplace very different than him than in Uzbekistan. So for me, it became very interesting to emphasize that what was happening in Harlem was brought out to the world and it did influence and change. So that's how I came to that. <laughs> Um, thank you. Um, I had a, a somewhat different route as you probably would have expected. Um, I was uh, overall really interested in early 20th century literature, kind of the first half of the 20th century. Um, I had, uh, before I entered my PhD program, I was able to take a class at the Graduate Center focused on um, women writers in the 1930s with uh, my late mentor, Jane Marcus. Um, and I became very, very interested in the um, overall effects of World War I on people people's sense of, um, of themselves in the world and modernity and sense of belonging um, and how all of the kind of contemporary issues that we grapple with, um, I wouldn't say that they have their roots there because obviously they go back much further, but a lot of, um, you know, just ways that people understand themselves and their places in the world um, were so affected by World War I and its fallout. And I think that um, you see that in, you know, in really stark terms within the Harlem Renaissance and kind of the, the reacting to the great loss, the understanding of a new sense of, um, of national identity um, for black people as Americans, um, disillusionment with all of the things that, you know, were kind of like held out as promises um, and also thinking about new ways of, um, of you know making communities and um and also celebrating life and so those things all kind of came together in um looking at the harlem renaissance um like zora i also had some undergraduate classes that gave me some sort of um you know little bubbles of thought around it but it was really a great joy to be able to take up that work in a deeper way in graduate school and continue it now thank you for that i do also want to say forgive me for not saying this at the outset uh audience members but we're gonna have a conversation for about half an hour more, and then we're gonna leave room for questions and answers. But please, as we are talking, if, if questions uh, uh, come to you, please don't afraid, don't be afraid to put them in the chat um, because we, we, I, don't, I don't like when people lose thoughts <laughs> because we like that you're engaged. Um, so I did wanna say that. So we'll stop about 6.40, the conversation, and then we'll, we'll questions and answers. Um, we'll have a Q&A session. Um, going back to what you just said, Lisa, about modernity, what you both just said, touching on the senses of belonging and home and things like that, and certainly the international aspect of the Harlem Renaissance, this is, you know, a very key moment, right? I mean, we are talking about one specific inflection point, but in my area where I'm thinking about Latin America and the Caribbean and even the, the Francophone Caribbean as well and Paris, and these are all international sites, right? So whether it's Negrismo in the Hispanic Caribbean or Negritud, right? These are the moments when, when black peoples in this hemisphere are really coming to understand themselves in different ways, right? Or relating in different ways to national consciousness or nation, nationalisms, right, in France. And we're seeing, and certainly again, World War II is a particular on this, uh, World War II, World War I on this side of the world is a particular inflection point. Um, Langston Hughes is, when people think about the Harlem Renaissance, he's that figure, right? Like he, most people, if they think, they may think of Zora Neale Hurston as well, right? Um, Lisa, you write about in your dissertation and in this work, you come at this through the lens of Nella Larson. And so could we speak specifically about why these figures um, spoke to you individually? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, did you want to finish no, I was. Thought? I was also okay. going to say, and if it's, um, this doesn't have to be, this could really truly be a conversation, meaning I'll pose the questions, but I do also encourage us to pose questions to each other. Right, okay. so that. Great. Um, so for me, a lot of my work does focus on maternity, um, not modernity, but maternity is in like the state of motherhood um, in this time period. So um, one of the things that happened um, during the early 20th century was there was this emerging idea of um, what a mother was, what a good family was in a really different way than there had been before. So while, you know, 
forever. Um, cultures have been structured around various forms of family. Um, the thing that I became sort of obsessed with in this time period is the way that motherhood started to be regulated in a really different way than it had been before. Instead of kind of there being these affective and labor issues around being a parent and raising a family, there was also this idea that being a mother was something that you could do well or you could do poorly, and you could also be subject to state intervention if you were doing it poorly. Um, there were there were certain aspects of paying greater attention to motherhood that were actually very positive. For instance, this was the time when you saw, you know, rules that you couldn't, you know, take contaminated water and put chalk dust in it and say that it was baby milk. Um, but it was also the time when um, especially white cultures became very, very concerned about, um, you know, the, the well-being of their kind of breeding stock, um, literally, um, especially when we had, you know, massive loss of life um, during the First World War and then during the flu pandemic um, of, I get 1918 to, I guess, about 1921. Um, and, uh, you know, there was this whole idea. So obviously this ties in very, very closely to the rise of um, eugenics. And um, this is, you know, a different way that uh, families and bodies were being regulated. Um, and they were put, you know, directly and really explicitly into the service of national identities. Um, you know, I think that for me, like a touch point that I go back to is that, um, you know, so Havelock Ellis, who was one of the early sexologists, said that, you know, he regards uh, sex as the central problem of life. And then you've got W.E.B. Du Bois saying in, you know, the same time period that the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. And while those things are often thought of as being sort of separate, I'm really indebted to the work of Siobhan Somerville and her book um, called Queering the Color Line, talking about how both like the, um, the gendering and the racialization of bodies um, were kind of produced by the same social forces and mechanisms. Um, and that within kind of the reproductive body, you have access to all of those controlling forces and it becomes a, a locus of a lot of anxiety. And so um, you see that in, in Nella Larson's work that deals with maternity in such explicit ways, both in her first work, Quicksand, um, that has this very kind of bleak outlook on motherhood. And then in um, Passing, where, you know, a thing that I'm very interested in it is I actually think that it's the book is structured very much like a pregnancy. Um, mm. And there are all of these uh, conversations that happen about being a good parent. And um, Irene, one of the, the protagonists, really being invested in being a good mother um, and you know, seeing what a struggle that was for them. And also thinking about the way that we reward certain kinds of families and we um, discourage and punish other kinds of families. So you know, that was one of the ways that I was coming at this work, but I think that like these ideas of how we control bodies and how they become in service to, you know, nationalism and then later emerging through the 30s fascism um, was something that was really a driver of the work that I was doing. Thank you so much for all of that. I, I, I'm, I, you remind me of Sadia Hartman's Wayward Lives, right? And, and talking about um, uh, beautiful experiments of her most recent publication where she is talking about this specific period, right? And the regulation of, uh, you know, she, she again uses her um, mode of critical fabulation to reimagine the lives of girls and women at this time who were being regulated by, you know, reformers at the time who really, you know, knew better, right? Knew better about how African-American, the African-American population should be living. Um, so thank you for that. I, I, it's all fascinating. Uh, Sora, how does your work intersect here? If at all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, for I me, know, I sort think- of, Sort of a specific, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't have any maternity, <laughs> but um, I think that there are some, uh, I mean, I was fascinated about how you're reading um, the stages, you know, the writing itself as, as maternity, that was beautiful. Uh, for me, I was thinking um, for Hughes, Hughes's uh, writings on uh, Central Asia for me was an anti-colonial um, piece of, an example of anti-colonial work. So it does connect with uh, negritude. It does connect with all of this because one, he was meeting um, poets uh, who 
were building an alliance with the African-American experience and really trying, not always the best poems, but trying to um, articulate some connection, which I think is quite fascinating. But when they say it's like, it's sometimes not so good, is only because it merges this old Chagatai style of um, romantic poetry and then merges it with this modern Soviet style that's coming up. So the styles are awkward. You know, I, I don't mean anything about the talent of the poets, but the style is that it's shifting from something formal and, you know, um, slightly Shakespearean to something that's more modern and trying to bring the world in. And when they meet Hughes, that's when they're making these connections. But I thought Hughes had some incredible observations and especially in the raw notebooks versus uh, what's written, but there's, here's a line um, that I'm going to read from I Wonder While I Wander in a published essay, South to Samarkand, which he wrote 20, 20 years after um, the uh, being in Central Asia, because he couldn't publish right away the works that he had done because of the McCarthy, McCarthyism and because of the trial he was in. So he had actually hidden and put away all of his work. And it actually, the stuff we find at Schomburg and at Yale uh, were almost destroyed in a flood. So that's the you know, sort of delicateness of, of paper and all the written stuff that he had collected. Uh, and one thing about Hughes is that when he travels, he doesn't just think about himself in this place, which is, again, I think, an anti-colonial move, uh, move in the kind of writing he creates. But he writes about himself in this community, and he builds community, and it starts out as simple as a smile, as sitting together with everyone and eating together, which is something that uh, Arthur Kostler, whom he meets there, in uh, Ashgabat um, uh, at a hotel and he's playing jazz music because he brought his uh, record players, of course. And uh, uh, so Kessler was attracted to that, went over and they became friends and they traveled. So uh, the difference between Kessler is that he thought that the Turkmen people, the Uzbek people were primitive and he writes about that. And when you read Kessler's work, he has that. I mean, he's a very complex and you know has gone through um, you know, um, ha, you know, he's he's not exactly the mainstream voice himself, but there's something in his writing that still emulates that colonial language of primitive versus civilized or modern. So this is what Hughes writes. Kessler says Turkmenistan was merely a primitive land moving into the 20th century. To me, it was a colored land moving into orbits hitherto reserved for whites. And I think in that line we have this alliance building that is really important in these notebooks and um, in his observations, in the photographs he takes, um, just every relation that he has there. It's humorous in South to Samarkand, more serious in the text he published in um, um, when he was there in Uzbekistan, he published A Negro Looks at Soviet Central Asia. Um, that is, uh, you know, he was, um, paid well to write this and he wrote it but in the notebooks you really find something else entirely there's like Hughes making sense connecting bridging together like Alexander going through Central Asia Tsarist Russia and then the current relations what are the hierarchies in newly formed Soviet uh, Turkestan and I think that kind of vision can only come from someone who's been through Jim Crow America right so you have that uh, in him so for him so I'll just leave it there. I could go on. Could you, it's okay going on. I was I was actually going to ask you to speak a little bit about. I mean, your your work is is covering a period that is really unwritten about with regards to Hughes, right? I.e., his approach or dance with communism or the Soviet. The focus really is on the Soviet Union um, in this moment, if people publish on it at all. But more likely than not, you know, Hughes scholarship really focuses on that. You know that young man, 1925. You know that's, and then the older man, <laughs> right? And there's there's so much about him, including his 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 own heritage. Um, again, where he comes from, how his father abandons the United States and flees to Mexico because he has nothing. He wants nothing to do with the United States. How Hughes is fluent in various languages, right? And how he survives as he is going every place. Um, and so if you could just talk a little bit about that part and how, you know, your work and what you bring to this, how that informs the overarching 
uh, body of work that we have with regards to Hughes scholarship. It's um, it's so interesting. So there is work done on Soviet um, the uh, ninth, So the time he went to the Soviet uh, Soviet Union and Soviet uh, Central Asia is nineteen. 32 to 1933 is this time in Uzbekistan and newly formed. These are all newly formed states. Before this, it was Turkestan, which is why the chapter I was writing was more interested in Turkestan because it comes up so much in his writing. And there's still so much work being done to separate the, the different uh, areas to make it a Turkmenistan and to make it an Uzbekistan. How do you make an Uzbekistan and a Tajikistan when they have like contested land between them? You know, that kind of thing is happening and he's recording it. Um, so there is stuff written about the Soviet experience, but I, I think that there's not enough emphasis on how much of a mark Hughes made because no one had gone down to see, of course, there are Americans who visited uh, Soviet Central Asia. I mean, uh, Central Asia when it was Turkestan in the 19th century and then early, um, early 20th century, uh, you know, all those uh, adventures, but they all have that kind of, you know, again, colonial voice travel narrative is, you know, um, dividing the world into what's civilized, what's not civilized, and kind of bringing back wondrous stories. Um, so the, I think the emphasis that I would want, and why I want, I'm writing, uh, turning this dissertation into a, a book is, because I want it to be known that Hughes really started this later, this trend to go down and see what was happening in Central Asia. When he asked permission to go down to see Central Asia, they did not want to give him permission because no one had gone down there. Um, I think that needs to be emphasized more because later in uh, 60s, 70s, more African-American uh, writers went to Central Asia, but that was the route. The Afro-Asia conference that happens in Kazakhstan, they start yeah. realizing, the Soviet Union starts realizing that, oh, there's a connection between the Black experience and the, you know, sort of the, the Central Asian experience. So they wanted to bring them together there. And there was some familiarity and connection they were able to make. So later, even Du Bois goes to Uzbekistan, right? So yes, a lot has not been written, but a lot has not been written about Central Asia. And a lot of times what happens in writings about whether it's Hughes or other African-Americans who went there, because when Hughes goes to Uzbekistan, he finds African-American engineers, architects, you know, agriculturalists who are working and have created the kind of cotton that worked in, in Uzbekistan. So he finds, you know, a good Christmas dinner in rural Uzbekistan where he's like totally, you know, pouty and upset because he just like can't deal with all the mud on his shoes. And it's a great, it's a great scene. He gets a, like, um, you know, a pumpkin pie out of, uh, out of all this and gets to celebrate Christmas. So Pumpkin is very popular in Central Asia too. So um, that, uh, so I feel like that detail, and sometimes when you have writings about Hughes in the Soviet Union, it's, it's Russia or Moscow, and it gets conflated with Central Asia as if they're very close or the same thing. So that distinction for me is important to make. So I, I'm there to just bring the nuance, the Central Asian nuance to the scholars who are writing about it from the perspective of someone coming in. But I also want to see that relationship that was built, which is, in, you can see it in the photos. You can see it in- That was going to be my cue, mass. Zora. That really <laughs> okay. was. That was going to be, if, if you could share your screen. <laughs> yeah, I, I will. Okay, let's hope I, okay. So here is the group photo. This is what inspired me to go um, search for these figures. So the uh, it was an article in Step Magazine, and they said it's Hughes and Rafael Rolom is over here. Actually, we I did not write on the photo, just so everyone knows. It's a photocopy of the, <laughs> the photo that I was doodling on. So here, so I figured out here when I did the research, and again, it's the research was at Yale, um, the Langston Hughes papers and at the Schomburg. And what I found was that the Schomburg had kind of the Rosetta Stone of information that helped me figure out. This is Shali Kekalov who traveled with them. He's a Turkmen poet. Um, this is uh, Rafa Ghulam. Uh, Langston Hughes translated his poems and published it in a leftist magazine. It's one of the first Uzbek poems to be translated into English. And he did this by translating it first into um, uh, French and then together with uh, a, a poet there, a Georgian poet. 
the Georgian translator who um, then they worked together. So from Russian to French to English, that's how they communicated. So she would get it in the Russian, uh, they would communicate, the Georgian poet and him would communicate in um, uh, French, and then he would translate that into English. And so there are a few poems uh, from this. And this very long epic poem is uh, part of the, the works that he kept. And he kept Shali Kekalov's work as well. And one thing about Hughes is that he's not only a poet, he's also, he's interested in translation. And this, again, and I think through translation, you build community. Um, relationships, connections, and that was really important for Hughes, and it's why it would, um, you know, the, his archives are so rich because, you know, their their stuff. Anyway, there's so much stuff. Here's um, Ali Tukumbayov, who was originally, who was then Tukumbajola, and he's a Kyrgyz poet. He later became known as the father of Kyrgyz, modern Kyrgyz poetry. Same thing with Rafa Ghulam. Shali Kekalov is a much more tragic end in World War II when Turkmen um, were conscripted into war in the front lines. And, um, you know, there's a uh, very tragic story of how many men were killed. And it was ranged from the age of 18 to 40. So he was one of those, uh, those soldiers. Um, let's see, here's another photo of Hughes and Kostler in the cotton collectives in Turkmenistan. So he's very fascinated by that connection. That's why he brings up South to Samarkand uh, he uses the word South in the Samarkand piece. He um, talked a lot about it. Cotton has a very strong connection for both. It's why Central Asia was colonized. 1865, uh, the end of slavery in the US uh, made other colonial powers think that they could be uh, cotton, you know, sort of um, have a monopoly over cotton. So uh, Imperial Russia took over parts of um, Central Asia or Turkestan and tried to grow cotton. It wasn't successful until Stalin, and it took people from Tuskegee and Virginia Tech uh, who had come and um, mixed American cotton with Egyptian cotton to create the kind of cotton that worked in Central Asia. So it's a fascinating history in itself. Um, here's Hughes with the Uzbek poet uh, Karim Ahmadi. He's wearing traditional outfit here, but in many other photos, he's in a very sort of, you know, um, suit and tie kind of thing. But he, what I found here in that archive at Yale, misfiled under Karen, not Kareem, was a poem that he had written to Hughes, which is that start of a love poem, then becomes this slogan poem, then becomes this sort of, um, you know, call not to forget him and to think of their connections. So that's that. And here's Hughes with a Russian poet and uh, who I don't know, I, and the Kyrgyz poet, um, Ali Tukumbayov. So um, he was just looking sad because he had a stomach ache. He got food poisoning before these photos. So I think there's more. There's uh, his roommate here, Nishanov. And here you see Bernard Powell's in the back, um, who was there to work in uh, Central Asia. This is, I forgot who that poet was, who that person was. These are the newspaper clippings he kept of Shali Kekalov. Uh, his writing. So Hughes ha also had a Turkmen language book. So he was both interested in learning another language and translation, I, I assume. So there's more poems. Hold on, I'm trying to find a better picture. Don't hope I don't give anyone motion sickness. Just bear with me. This is all the stuff at the Schomburg. Here's the, the Turkmen lesson book that he had that he was learning and it was, you know, sort of given to him as a gift. It's, it just means, uh, lesson book. Uh, oops, that Here, this is Bernard Powers. They're having uh, a meeting uh, as they're building new roads in those cotton collectives. So there's Hughes and there's one other beautiful photo. I wonder if I have it here. Oh, here's another one. There's Karim Ahmadi, who was also uh, wearing traditional garb by the wheel photo. And I think, oh, there's another photo of him. This is a photo Hughes took on the cotton collectives. So there's a lot of propaganda photos of uh, children being happy and not working on the collectives, but Hughes's photo is really telling. You see this 10 year old, I guess she's 10 years old, uh, kind of having a weathered look, looking tired and kind of doing the labor. What you have in a lot of Soviet photographs are these kind of happy, oh, there's Hughes, this was any much older. 
And uh, that's a traditional Uzbek outfit. Hold on, I wanna find you. These are Hughes's photos that he took. I wanna go too quickly here. Uh, this is uh, Joseph Rohn, who was there. He was a, uh, an agriculturalist and he was developing, and he's wearing an Uzbek hat, a tuzdupa, which is like a black and white hat that protects you. You know, it's sort of like, it's a hat, but it's also has a symbol of like protection and keeping the evil eye away. But he was the agriculturalist there and he has a great story. He's from Virginia. So he has a documentary about him and his life and his son, because he went with his wife, he was a newlywed uh, and his son was born in Uzbekistan. So they named the son without his permission, Joseph Stalin Rohn. So there's a funny story about um, his life and his contributions. Here are the propaganda photos. So it looks very clean and scientific and uh, that, you know, kind of children weren't on the fields. It also erases a lot of black uh, contribution to uh, the science of developing cotton in uh, Uzbekistan. So uh, one of the works is when you write about this is to get all the, the uh, scientists and agriculturalists and uh, name out like Bernard Powers, like um, uh, uh, Joseph Rohn as well. So those are the fun photos. So I was kind yes. of obsessed with this photo. <laughs> you have three or four books. I just, I just want to say, I think between like a photo book specifically on Langston Hughes photography, which again, I haven't seen, I'm unaware of that on the market. Um, and, and for, and for our audience, this is, this is me speaking as a series, a book series editor going, Whoa, <laughs> there is so much. Um, I want to return to what you were saying though, or pick up on that last point regarding again, science, which it, it science erasure again, at this moment, the, the tension between primitive versus colonized or, or primitive and civilized what is modern, what is not. This is the moment here in the United States, here in New York, right? Where Franz Boas and, and, the, and Columbia University's Department of Anthropology is really, really solidifying what are those definitions. And part of that is not only in terms of who is passing through that department and then who goes out and travels, right? So um, Zora Neale Hurston is known to have been, you know, in that department, um, Ruth Benedict, Margaret Mead, Ruth Landis, uh, all of these men, women, who, and then they go out, right? So Lisa, could we talk a little bit about, like, if returning to, you You mentioned eugenics, right? You mentioned this is, this is that moment. This is, you know, this is a Margaret Sanger, Planned Parenthood moment as well in terms of specifically modernity, uh, maternity. I'm going to stop that. Um, <laughs> You can't when you literally you can't it's what I do all the time so just kind of, you know, you know, play up the uh, the interplay between the two words. Yeah. Speak a little bit more about how you are seeing this and again, whether it's specifically through the prism of Larson's work and it's a fascinating idea that the structure of passing is itself a pregnancy. Um, mm -hmm. But just overall your impressions of how these threads are being woven together uh, in this moment? I mean, of course, like my great interest is Larson's work, but it is omnipresent in what you see. And, you know, my interest is not only in, um, the research I've done isn't only on the Harlem Renaissance, it's also in various uh, Anglophone literatures, um, especially by queer women and how they were trying to configure their relationship to motherhood in the state. Um, so, you know, I've also looked at the work of Radcliffe Hall and of um, Sylvia Townsend Warner and Jean Rhys and kind of how they had really different ways of navigating all of these things. But I think that even outside of that, this was really, you know, sort of when, um, when eugenics wasn't a yet, you know, um, a, people hadn't understood yet that it was a bad idea. I was like, reviled? Um, yes. I'm like, you know, it was, like, it was really like, the, you know, of, of the moment. Um, and there were these great concerns. You're talking about, you know, the influence of, um, of Columbia anthropology. There were all of these, um, you know, really popular books that were, um, you know, kind of the basis of scientific racism. And um, they were, they were really, um, 
they were popular. They were in some ways seen as progressive. They were um, kind of really informing um, the way that a lot of people were approaching kind of the idea of how to make the world better, um, which is, you know, really just horrifying to look back on now. And I think, um, I think a part that's under explored there is also thinking about um, the traumas that um, specifically black par black parents had faced under enslavement and the way that they had to think about making families, making healthy families, um, making you know their communities whole um and the way that those traumas had prevented it but instead um that was cast as you know being some kind of a fundamental flaw in their own abilities to be citizens to be parents to be um thriving and so i think that you see that in you know a, a lot of works um and it's something i think that also i want to i want to bring this back to your work as well but um i think that we've heard so much from Yuzora about um you know, the, the internationalism of Hughes. And I think that for somebody like Larson, um, who had a, a Danish mother and a West Indian father, um, her her displacement throughout um, many of the environments that she lived in, because she, you know, she lived in Harlem. She spent time in Denmark with her mother. Um, she spent time there as an adult. She lived, you know, in more rural settings and not really being able to find where she fit into it. And I think that, um, you know, through the literature of this period used to see this kind of um you know reckoning with all of these kind of patterns is institutions um that were causing harm and that were um you know like what we see now is like a very nostalgic idea of like an American family that was actually like written down and codified. And there was this idea that, you know, the, an American family is, um, is white, it's large, it lives in the country probably. Um, there's even, if you look at, you know, you think about, um, European countries after white European countries after World War I, um, really having these very um, explicitly pronatalist policies, meaning that they were encouraging people to have children. Um, and in the United States, you might think that that's a little bit less prevalent, but really the way that westward expansion happened was through policies that were really helping to, um, you know, give land and means to white families to populate them and to grow and to be large and kind of, you know, make sure that they were the predominant um, race throughout North America and the these families that were um, living elsewhere were you know given far fewer advantages so um, I think that you know bringing it back to the idea of displacement you know like wherever Larson went it was really hard for her to figure out what her niche was and so she had this extremely cosmopolitan and international experience in her life and yet not one of belonging or home and I think that um, you know I think that that's just something that we have to remember about what kind of um, you know agency people have in crafting their own experience? Um, also, want to throw in that her husband was a physicist. If we're talking about black scientists, but um, we don't need to get into that. But um, I'd love to hear also about your your own work, though, in um, Afro Caribbean and also in Schomburg, obviously with the Danish connection and the idea of um, being you know an international cosmopolitan figure is a choice or or not. Yeah, I mean, I think it's 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 absolutely. It, it is true that the three of us bring that together because I think in the same way as the three figures with whom we are concentrating at the moment, I mean, Adula Schomburg, uh, whether we born in San Dulce, Puerto Rico, um, at the time that he is born, that is, well, it, it, prior to it being named San Dulce, it was San Mateo de Cangrejos. It's the only uh, town in Puerto Rico that was actually founded by those uh, formerly enslaved folks who had escaped enslavement from the surrounding islands, including the then Danish West Indies, but also Vieques and Culebra, the smaller um, Puerto Rican islands. Uh, and so, you know, uh, Evelyn Laurence Perot has an article where she talks about his subjectivity as a maroon subjectivity, right? That, oh, it, it's a fugitive subjectivity. And so again, that idea of displacement of migration of always searching always always trying to find and I think the three figures that we work with are all searching for that and come up with it to a greater or lesser extent right um, you know Atula Schomburg marries three times his first two wives pass away he marries African-American women all from the south all with the name uh, Elizabeth um, fun fact um, <laughs> And, and so, at, but for himself, you know, his, 
His maternal line is from the Danish West Indies. The father's line is Germanic because it wasn't a unified Germany, but the family had been in the island of Puerto Rico. To your point about empires that encourage migration, right? The Spanish crown wanted Europeans, particularly Germans, to settle in their colonies. And so the Schomburg family, when he is born, is about 50 years on that island. Um, so they are a Puerto Rican family, just not the kind that, that we normally think of. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think that from my perspective, Adula Schomburg is involved in a series of networks where he is constantly, he's never by himself, right? And so while we study these folks as the great man or the great woman or, you know, um, or folks are writing, write about them in that way. I, what I am fascinated about is how black peoples in particular, certainly those who are, uh, come from families who are from descendants of enslaved peoples, how they then reform family or home or belonging in various areas of their lives. So whether it's fraternal societies, such as, you know, the, the Prince Hall Masons, whether it's, um, and this is again throughout the hemisphere, whether it's churches, whether it's uh, Greek life, Panhellenic Greek life um, in the divine nine, whether it's, and we continue to see that into today, whether we talk about um, you know, houses, right? In ball culture uh, or different kinds of churches, right? Or different in with voodoo, with candomblé, with santeria, those are houses, right? Those are called ilays, right? That ilay word is, is um, a Yoruba word. Right, that you see that transfer. And so again, there's a constant always recreation of that which we think of as in spatial uh, terms, but really it's, it's how do we recreate family, right? Uh, and, and, and then what are the dynamics of that? What are the maternal, paternal um, children? What, how does that relate to everything that's happening uh, in, the, in the societies in which they lived? So I hope, I feel like we've highlighted a lot. <laughs> A lot of these, like, and you can tell, and I hope our audience can tell, um, you know, these are, these are things that we are thinking through and they are um, open, right? They're, they're not, we're not tying these up neatly and carefully because I think, you know, my colleagues and myself are active researchers who are constantly thinking about, learning about, writing about these things. So this would be the moment where we would follow uh, Charmaine's lead and, and, and place your questions in the chat. We do have a couple of questions from our colleague, uh, Dr. Ugaritz. Um, so one is, uh, he would love to hear stories from each of us about how our research has enriched us in our career, in other studies, in teaching, in life. So let's start there. Um, I would say I'll I'll take that one first for now. Um, I would say for me it was a, a discovery that I I never thought would happen. So Langston Hughes is always very New York for me. It's how um, I loved his poems in a way a poet. I mean I'm, I'm a poet and I write poetry. So for me it was felt the most um, beautiful, but. To find in the Hughes archive some some of my own family history and connections was really interesting to use a language that I only use, you know, it's like my kitchen Uzbek to be you was like suddenly unearthed as like this 1920s time capsule version of Turkic that I can use to translate and then to read and to look at the works really like blew my mind like I was like. And then, you know, there's this line where Hughes, it just gave me chills. Um, Hughes goes to Amir Timur, who was one of the sort of um, imperial kings of, of Central Asia, or I don't know what I would call him, but uh, he goes to Amir Timur's mausoleum. And he's like, how did I, a poor black person from, black man from Harlem get to here? And I was like, in Harlem, in the Schomburg, by the medallion where his, um, you know, his remains were interned. And I just had this like moment where like, how did I, like a poor, you know, grad student, like from uh, Afghanistan, Uzbek, come and, and sit here and, and find this story and learn from him. I felt the same kind of grandness that he felt at the, the mausoleum in Samarkand. So for me, it was like, 
it was a really powerful moment. And I followed that. And when I would be stuck, I would go to the medallion area where Hughes was and I would, you know, just be there and talk. And sometimes I'd walk over to where before it became Hughes house, which I didn't, unfortunately didn't last for too long, but I would go to his home and sit by the steps. And for some reason it brought everything together and it made it real and tangible. So yeah, for me, it connected a whole lost family history I knew nothing about. Thank you for that, Lisa. Um, yeah, mine is, I mean, th there's a couple of different strands for me. And one is just the, the enrichment that reading brings to everybody's life. And I think that if you are a person, especially if you are a child who really found, you know, your world inside of books, and then you were able to have the privilege to grow up and study that, it's, um, it's an amazing, amazing opportunity. But I think that in terms of the specific path that I took, um, I had been working on literatures from this time period, but it wasn't until I decided to have a child that I really started looking at the maternity angle of it. Um, and what I was looking for there wasn't something to, um, you know, just fold into the personal experience that I was having, but to really examine the anxieties that I was having about it and the ambivalence that I felt not about becoming a parent, but about all of the different kinds of apparatuses that were attached to it. Um, so I, this, is, this is, I'm gonna say something very personal, but it's not a secret, everybody knows it. Um, you know, I'm queer, my daughter is donor conceived and, you know, like literally going through a catalog and like, picking out like, you know, genetic materials to like order online. And then um, her other parent needed to adopt her formally. And it really formed this different um, relationship between how I understood, um, you know, the way that states intervene into families, um, which had been something that I had not been unaware of, but seeing like the real direct control. And I started um, looking back through the time period that I was already looking at um, to see like what resonances I could find there. And really it was all just waiting. It was like waiting for me right there. Um, and because I was, you know, during this process, I was like, oh no, or like, do we have to be like complicit in this eugenics project and what's happening? And, um, you know, and Yes, and it was okay to feel ambivalent about it. And it was also okay to make a family and a community in the way that we wanted to. And um, seeing the way that there had been people who had uh, needed to examine really the way that they um, were able to make or not make families in relationship to the state um, in much more dire circumstances um, without my privileges was really informative. And I think really important history for me to acknowledge and also to pass on to my child and be like, there's a lot that's going on here and it's okay to talk about it. Um, and, you know, so I think that it's been, uh, you know, really just like both like the, the joys and working through like, you know, life's really like big challenges through a lens of literature, through somebody else's um, experiences that you can, um, you know, learn from without appropriating and also just understand more about the world and the systems that, that shape us. Yeah, I, I want to highlight that which few people know. So my dissertation is about my own anxiety around motherhood and it manifested, uh, my dissertation is called Mothers, what is it? The Search for Womanhood, Mothers and Daughters, The Search for Womanhood in the Americas. And it was when I was, you know, I started my dissertation at like 26, 27. I, I think I finished at 28. Um, and this is right around the time when I'm looking at my mother and going, I can't be a mother like you. Like, God bless you, because my mother is the prototypical self-sacrificing mother who loves us unconditionally. And it is such a beautiful and magnificent blessing to have. But I wondered about, she's also someone that um, for her, if a woman doesn't do that, if she strays from that at all, then she questions that definition, right? And so I was in a PhD program. I had anticipated... Um, I would probably work, right? And so I, for me, I go, wow, outside of that, that self-sacrificing mode, what happens and what are the representations of liter in literature when those mothers and daughters in particular, when that relationship fractures? Um, and so I was looking at novels and you know, Toni Morris and Sula and um, a novel, you know, a, uh, Elena Padenchicuña's Amuleno Espelio, Woman Mirrors, right? And where all of these women go, um, there's two more in there. Um, and so I, I wanted to bond with you on that moment, Lisa. Um, but in terms of my, 
and also in terms of my own personal experience with my work, I mean, but the reason I got to Arturo Schomburg is that I, you know, I learned about him when I was in college and I was flabbergasted that, as you said, there was a library <laughs> because for those of us who enjoy books, <laughs> who found ourselves in books and in reading as children, um, you know, for me, the library was a safe space. For me, the library was home. And, you know, to have gone away to college and to learn that there was a library uh, that was named after this Black man, which was the first intro, and then that Black man was born in Puerto Rico, which is where my family's from. And then it's part of the New York Public Library, which is astounding, and it's in Harlem, and I grew up in the Bronx, and just realizing that I didn't know anything about this place. Um, and to Zora's point, I don't know how many people know that Langston Hughes's ashes are interred in the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. Um, so I'm gonna just share the screen for a second um, and to reference what she was speaking about with regards to the cosmogram. So here is the Schomburg Center, over here, or a part of it. Um, there's the Schomburg Center, there's Mr. Schomburg, but this is the corner of 135th Street and Malcolm X Boulevard slash um, Lennox Avenue. This is the bookshop. That is a fabulous bookshop. If you have not been to the Schomburg Center, if for anything, the bookshop there, they have lots of amazing work um, and, and children's books and, and, and totes and just fabulous, fabulous place. One of my favorites. There's Mr. Schomb uh, Mr. Mr. Hughes. And here's the cosmogram and his, this is the lobby. Like you enter into the, no, I don't want a free book. Um, <laughs> you enter into the lobby of that space and under that cosmogram which speaks, which has around it, um, Mr. Hughes's probably most famous poem, certainly most widely anthologized poem and his ashes are buried in that space. And so again, um, for so many of us, the Schomburg Center is a sacred space um, it is literally a sacred space, right? And for, for anyone who is doing work on the, on the global black diaspora and on, on, on global um, black excellence. So thank you, Zora, for, for speaking about that. Claudio Simpkins writes with, or has written here, with affirmative action on the chopping block, how can academics and others ensure that the actual descendants of slavery can study and be scholars of their own black history? Well, Claudio, for me, I mean, affirmative action is a really recent um, policy in this country. And quite frankly, descendants of enslaved peoples have been writing their histories from prior to that. You know, I mean, Arturo Schomburg did not benefit from a college education, right? He was a high school graduate. Uh, he worked lots of different kinds of jobs. This was not a wealthy man by any stretch of the imagination. Um, he, he, what he did was he worked as a clerk in the mail room of a bank downtown. That was when he was more further established, but he was a waiter. He delivered, he, he did deliveries. When he came to New York, he worked with a letter of recommendation from a printing press in Puerto Rico here. Um, so this, it's, it's, I think sometimes it, it, it benefits us, it behooves us to look back, right? And see what models have, again, outside of spaces that we think of as consecrated as to be the only spaces in which this work gets done. It's happening all the time. It's happening on social media, you know, access to, and, and always as black peoples, again, throughout the hemisphere, the history of black peoples who actually create their own presses, who write their own, and I mean, printing presses, newspapers, journals. I mean, it is such an astounding history, one that, we, that many of us don't know enough about. And so we benefit from having public libraries in this country. We benefit from access to certain spaces, certainly with the pandemic. I know the Schomburg Center has, has a, and the NYPL in general has um, a scan and delivery uh, service now where if we look things up, um, now that also requires of course internet access, but there are always ways. And I think for me, the biggest takeaway from studying black history, again, across, uh, nation states in this hemisphere, because that's what I do, uh, is 
it is always seeing the ingenuity of black peoples in the face of absolute horror and genocide, that there's always a solution. And it is often one that is not dependent upon politicians, certainly not here in the United States. I don't know if anyone else wants to, wants to answer. Here, here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, uh, did did either of you want to have a have a, another question for for each other, or before you know? Because Joe, other people have to talk. So I'll get back to your question. I promise. <laughs> We're, I think we're both trying to say like, who's gonna you know, ask a question first? Um, I think that because we get to work so closely together, I feel like there's many conversations we've had that have been able to, um, you know, we've been able to answer questions to each other in a private space. And I'm trying to think of like, what's the one that I would want to display most um, before an audience? Um, because I've just learned so much through um, my teaching partnership and um, work with Zora, and I'm really grateful for it. Um, and, uh, you know, so I think that um, if there's a, I don't know, I don't have an immediate question, but if one comes to me, then I okay. will, will ask. Or comments, it. or okay. comments. I mean, yeah, that's fine. I mean, again, I just spoke about presses and Zora. Oh. <laughs> well, no, I actually was wondering how you did it all. Like you balanced writing and researching and then just how did how how did I, you do it? How yeah. did you do that? <laughs> um so i it, it i i love writing and that's a secret right I love... it is a secret i will tell you this because we teach the thesis class together and we've try, been trying to impress upon our students that nobody loves writing so we might have to have you come in and be like we found the person who loves writing and she's going to tell you all about it <laughs> i can absolutely because i think that that's i i yes and I tell you why, right? I think because beyond the discipline and the, of the craft of it, right? I had a director as we're coming up on, on the end of this hour, I had a doctoral uh, advisor who made me give him drafts of things every month. And, and the first time I missed that deadline, because you know, perfectionists, high achievers, you know what I mean, um, <laughs> because it wasn't right. Um, he brought me into his office and asked me if I liked pain. And I said, no. And he says, well, do you like inflicting pain? And I said, again, no. And he said, well, I uh, feel physical pain when you uh, drop a deadline. And so you have the choice of having another doctoral advisor or giving me what you have. And I was like, oh! <laughs> so, but what that meant was what he did was that he short circuited the perfectionism, right? Because what that meant, I said, but what if I'm not finished? He said, I don't care if you have, you're in the middle of a sentence. You give me what you have every month and bless him because that's how I write. When I'm drafting, I give myself uh, a certain deadline. So certainly with a book project, a period of months, I still do that like every month, like a new, you know, something, a different chapter, I conceptualize, and every month, and it's like, boom, okay, well, this might be 15 pages of notes, that might be 35 pages of notes, whatever. And I go through it and I love it because I see it come, because it's not about perfection, right? It is about the freedom of throwing paint on a blank canvas and going, hey, this is fun. I'm making something up. That's the other part of it is that so much about writing within the academy, right, is, is about the intellect and, the, and it's no, it's not, it's a creative act. Which, and so for me, if I was ever to do a TED talk, here is my, um, my mini introduction. What about creation is play? That's it, because that's all we're doing. That is all we are doing is that we and we can be have like these very serious topics, which we all are dealing with. But how do you balance that out? Right. I ask my friends all the time who are historians of enslavement. Right. How, how do you do that? 
how do you, you know, and what do they do in terms of self-care? But for me, it is absolutely not about drudgery. It is absolutely not about, and that's, that's why I'm so prolific because I get to play every single time I go, that's a book, that's a book. And, it, and then I get to show up for myself, right? Because that's at the end of the day, this is something that I love. And so for me, writing and creativity is a space by which you can demonstrate the love for your subject. You know, for me, it's kind of, it's, it, it is actually one of the greatest tra travesties of academic um, training um, in general that we've all been subject to. Right, this idea of like tying writing to, you know, tenure, tying to it, grades, tying it to perfection, tying it to like, how do we take that spirit of ingenuity and of innovation and of creativity, right, and 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 move it over to love, because at the end of the day, my writing is an offering of love. So yes, I would be very happy to talk to your students. I would love, I mean, I just also very emotional. That was very beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you both. Um, it is 7.01. Um, so I want to respect time. Uh, Charmaine, do you want to come back? Hi, Charmaine. She's back. Thank you so much, Charmaine. <laughs> oh, this was so beautiful and enlightening and amazing. Just stuff that I did not know of and now have to go to my own research and just talking about, you know, going to the public library, doing your own research, knowing that author, you know, he, you know, not educated, um, he didn't go to college, but found solace in, you know, libraries. So, and he didn't do it alone. So I think a lot of the times just, I know we're running out of time, but knowing that our Macaulay students coming in as a cohort, they're coming in together. So you have this space that you're not alone. Even when you leave Macaulay, you still have that connection and you still have your cohorts that you came in with that you connect with. So I hope that any alums that's on this, um, you know, we're here for you at Macaulay and hope you stay connected with us. Um, we love having you back here. Thank you. Thank you, Charmaine. Thank you all for coming. Please, everyone, be safe. Have a beautiful evening. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you.